Now, in, in chapter 26, uh, he, we've got kind of a, uh, from here to the rest of the book, we've kind of got God going to do some final preparations before he takes this second generation of the children of Israel into the promised land. So earlier, 40 years earlier, you remember, uh, earlier in the book, he had called the children of Israel and uh, he had told Moses, I want you to number the tribes of Israel. I want to know what the numbers of, in every tribe of all of the men who are 20 years and, uh, and above so that I can know what the size of the army is, so to speak. So uh, because they're going to go in and, and as an army, they're going to conquer the land. So they did the numbering 40 years earlier, but that whole generation has has died off. And it's interesting when you well, let's read verse one. And it came to pass after the plague. You could circle that after the plague in your mind, because with that plague, there came an end of that entire previous generation, except for Joshua, Caleb and Moses. So now the first generation is completely gone. The second generation that has been wandering for the 40 years, now they're ready to go into the land, so they need to renumber the people. And so that's what's going on here. The numbering of the people is twofold reason for it. Number one, to, again, establish the, the numerically the size of the army that they have, the number of men over the age of 20. And then number two, based upon the size of that population among the different tribes, they would then that would determine the size of the portion of land that would be allotted to them. When they go into the promised land, and conquer it, God has already, uh, had, has already determined what tribe is going to have what portion of the land. He establishes that. Numerically, that's not going to have any bearing on it. God is going to put them where he wants to put them. But then, having put them in either the north, the south, the east, or the west, then how big their borders are going to be in terms of, you know, coming upon the borders of another tribe, that will be established by what their numbers are and thus their ability to uh, conquer that land and hold on to that land. And so it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and above by their father's houses, all who are able to go to war. So again, we're going to number to see what the size of, of the military is that you can field. And so Moses and Eliezer the priest spoke with them in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho saying, take a census of the people from 20 years old and above, just as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel who came out of the land of Israel. So we're going to take a new census just like we did 40 years earlier. And then here is the census, the results of that census. In, in verse 5, Reuben was the firstborn of Israel. The children of Reuben were, I'm, I'm not going to inflict pain upon you by trying to pronounce all of these names. But you notice as you get down into verse 7, these are the families. So the first tribe that's, that's numbered is the tribe of Reuben. These are the families of the Reubenites. Those who were numbered of them were 43,730. Their prior number was 46,500. So over the course of 40 years, they have a, a, a decline of 2,770. Verse 12 there is the second tribe that is mentioned, the sons of Simeon. And you notice in verse 14, these are the families of the Simeonites uh, and, and the numbering 22,200. Now, their prior number was 59,300. They have a net loss of 37,100 people, which causes us to believe that the uh, overwhelming majority of the 24,000 people who died in the plague, uh, and, and then the, some other number of people that were killed by the leaders within the camp, independent of the plague, that uh, this particular plague was highly concentrated in the tribe of Simeon. And so, because there's no other explanation for so dramatic uh, a drop. Verse 15, the sons of Gad... 
at the time of the numbering in verse 18, they numbered here 40,500. Previously, uh, they were 40,500. Uh, 40, Previously, 45,650. So a negative 5,150. I, I, this is for the accountants in the fellowship. God bless you. The sons of Judah, verse 19, uh, as we jump down to verse 22, at this point in time, they were numbered 76,500. And so their prior number was 74,600, so we got a plus of 1,900. The sons of Issachar, verse 23, the time, at this point, their numbers were, at the end of verse 25, 64,300. Prior, they were 54,400, so we've just 100 under 10,000 in, in the plus. The sons of Zebulun, verse 26. Notice in the end of verse 27, they were numbered at 60,500. Prior was 57,400, so we've got a plus of 3,000. 100. Verse 28, the sons of Joseph, and verse 29, very specifically, the sons of Manasseh from that family. And uh, you notice at the end of verse 34, they now numbered 52,700. Prior uh, to this, they were 32,200, so we got a plus 20,500. And so this is the greatest increase among any of the tribes was the tribe of Manasseh. Then verse 35, the tribe of Ephraim, as you go down there into verse 37, they numbered at this time 32,500. Prior they were 40,500, so we've got a, uh, a negative 8,000. Benjamin, verse 38, uh, as you look at the end of verse 54, or 41 rather, oh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Okay, verse 41, they numbered at this point in time 45,600. Previously, they were 35,400, so a plus 10,200. The uh, tribe of Dan, verse 42, notice at the end of verse 43, they numbered now 64,400. Previously, they were 62,700, so a plus 1,700. And then in verse uh, 44, we see the sons of Asher, the tribe of Asher. And uh, at the end of uh, verse 47, we see they numbered 53,400. Previously, 40 years earlier, 48,500, uh, so a plus 4,000. Uh, 900 verse 48 the sons of Naphtali that tribe notice at the end of verse 50 they numbered now 45,400 previously 53,400 so a negative 8,000 there and then here's the total verse 51 for those of you who like the bottom line uh, we did the rest of it for those of you who can't uh, you don't like a bottom line until you know how you got there so we're, we're trying to please everybody here tonight is everybody pleased okay it's very lukewarm. I hope it got on the tape. Um, those who were uh, these are those who were numbered of the children of Israel six six hundred and one thousand seven hundred and thirty. And so um, that was uh, that number was one thousand eight hundred and twenty less than the first numbering 40 years earlier. So uh, about the same. And so we see. The, even the numbering of things is a witness to, is a witness to, number one, God's grace to them for 40 years in that wilderness. He kept them numerically the same. But in keeping them largely numerically the same, it is a testimony to the fact that there is no um, increase, there is no fruitfulness in a life of living in the wilderness living the Christian life that is short of appropriating the uh, promises of God in our lives, going into those promises, possessing those promises. A failure to do that leads to a life that you're, I'm still a child of God, I'm still on the way uh, to heaven, but there's nothing s dramatic about it, nothing that you know speaks of God about such a life. It's just kind of... Uh, you know, holding my own, which is when a person is just living a life of kind of kind of holding their own, then there's no witness of the spirit. 
It's a supernatural life that gets the attention of people and to realize there's something about their life that's different than uh, other lives. And look how God has blessed them. Look at the fruit and, and, and blessings of their life that then gets people to realize that God is being allowed to be fully engaged in, in our lives. And so they didn't do bad. They didn't do good. That's what life in the wilderness uh, looks like. And then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, to these the land shall be divided as an inheritance according to the number of names. And so these tribes, the land was going to be divided among these 12 tribes. And then as we saw, before, uh, I mentioned before, to a large tribe you shall give a larger inheritance. To a small tribe you shall give a smaller inheritance. Each shall be given its inheritance according to those who were numbered uh, of them. But... The land shall be divided by lot, and, and they would determine God's will by the casting of lots. God, uh, they trusted him to direct the lots in, in, in getting the people to have the land that, that God wanted them to have. So, where, again, where they ended up in the land, uh, God is saying that he would determine the size of the land, their population would determine. But the land shall be divided, verse 55, by lot. They shall inherit according to the names of the tribes of their fathers, according to the lot. Uh, their inheritance shall be divided between the larger and smaller. And these are those who are numbered of the Levites according to their families. So the Levites, the tribe of Levi, is numbered separately from the children, uh, the other tribes of Israel, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they were not going to be a part of the army. Uh, they, their entire focus was directed upon the spiritual uh, health of the nation. And number two, they were not going to inherit any land. They would, they would inherit uh, Levitical cities, but not land the way the other tribes would. And so they're in kind of a different uh, a different category, and so they come into a different place in the numbering in the chapter. So these are those who were numbered of the Levites according to their families, of Gershon, the family of the Gershonites, of Kohath, the family of the Kohathites, of Merari, the family of the Merarites. These are the families of the Levites, the family of the Libnites, the family of the Hebronites, the family of the Malites, the family of the Mushites, and the family of the Korathites, and Kohath begot Amram, and the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. And to Amram she bore Aaron and Moses and their sister Miriam. So you want to know a little bit about the lineage of Moses? It's right there uh, as a Levite. It's right here in the, in the history of, of the tribe of, of Levi. Without this passage, we wouldn't know the names of Moses' um, parents. To Aaron was born Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar, uh, and Nadab and Abihu died when they offered profane fire before the Lord. Now those who were numbered of them, so here's the numbering of the, the tribe of Israel at this point in time, were 23,000. And so uh, 40 years earlier they numbered 22,000, so a net gain uh, of, of a thousand in that tribe. They were numbered a little bit differently than the other tribes. The other tribes were numbered from the age uh, males, the age 20 and above. Here, in the numbering of the Levites, it was every male numbered from a month old and above, for they were not numbered among the other children of Israel because there was no inheritance given to them among the children of Israel. These are those who were numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. But among these, uh, there were not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And then notice that next word, it's an important one. So there was not left a man of them except Caleb, the son of uh, Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So God had promised that entire generation was going to die off. And only Joshua and Caleb would, would survive it and, and enter into the land. God is absolutely faithful in his 
promises, promised to bless us in his word, but he is also unerringly faithful in, in his word as it relates to judgment. And so it came to pass the key is to be on the right side of the things of God so that we can experience his faithfulness as it relates to blessing and not uh, to judgment. So we'll stop there and we'll get a chance to enjoy communion tonight. Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Let me say, let me say uh, one thing as we leave this whole incident at um, the all of Peor with the sexual immorality of God's people with, with the, the w- women of, of Midian and the whole, you know, that whole mess of things. Here's the straight betwixt two that I find myself in continually as a pastor and a teacher of the word of God. I'm like everybody else. I, every single one of us is tempted by numerous things in this world. If, if any man thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. I remember listening to a, a pastor teach many, many years ago, and he said, he, he exhorted us as, as pastors, and he said, you better teach above your experience. Now, I'm not saying I'm engaged in the sin of Baal of Peor. But to take the word of God and to declare it, my responsibility is to lay out the high standard. Not to bring it down because that's not what I'm called to do. Uh, We lay the standard out, what God will allow us, the standard he will allow us to live by his Holy Spirit, and then a person has to seek God individually, surrender to God individually, to determine for themselves how much of this life that God describes in his word any of us will, will uh, um, uh, appropriate and, and, and experience. But, the, but because we do live in a nation that is very, very sexually immoral, and, uh, and in a world that is very, very sexually immoral, I don't want anybody to sit here that comes from that kind of a background, however however long ago or however recently, to feel bad about that. I want want the strength of the word to hit our lives. And I want us to, um, uh, I want it to cleanse us. I want it to, to purge us and I want it to equip us. But I know that you can talk about some of these things and our backgrounds can kind of flash up before us and we begin to think that we're extraordinarily terrible. That's not my intent in any way to condemn anyone. Now, if a person's sitting here tonight and you are present tense, actively unrepentant in engaging in willful sin and you call yourself a Christian, um, I'm not talking to you at all right now. Uh, you, you're another category. You need to repent tonight. And you certainly need to repent before you partake of the symbols of Jesus' broken body and his shed blood that was broken and shed for you to live a different kind of life in this world. That's a very high price that was paid for us not just to be saved, but to live a life of freedom to his glory. So I don't want anybody feeling like oh, I'm the worst person in the whole world because of, of this. And, and uh, you know, and you know, you bring this up and the whole thing and it tweaks all these things inside of me. That's not what I'm in, intending to do. And, I, you know, you hit it all the time because you come in and you say, I got to lay out the standard of this word. And I know that this is going, this is not going to be fun for some people in, in the room. But it's the way that it is. And we don't, God didn't ask me to be a mediator related to the word of God. So that's my point here on things. God forgives. He gives us a fresh start. We need to take holiness seriously in our lives tonight and and from this moment forward. Because we have tonight and we have this moment forward in our walk with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter Um, 11 let me just read with me from verse 23 where Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he said for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you and here's here's what uh, he he had received and he delivered to them that the Lord Jesus and this is very important on the same night he was betrayed ever had anybody do anything wrong to you (laughs) 
No, me either. But he took bread. Now, we all know betrayal. On the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is saying, Don't forget about me in this Christian life. It's about me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason, there are many weak and sick among you and many who sleep. They've died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, 